Yes, yeah. great. All right, so let me present, and let me go to the first slide. All right, so um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm uh, really excited to uh, have this discussion about financial abuse. Um, I've I, I, I structured this training to be pretty like um, kind of casting a wide net of really just bringing everyone up to speed and up to date with like what we're talking about when we think about financial abuse, what forms it can take, um, what different people are at possible risk for it. Um, also how the current um, situation of the world of COVID has impacted financial abuse and, and um, what folks are seeing. And then the ending of the presentation is really like how we can help. Um, and how we can kind of structure um, a safe environment for folks who are possibly going through financial abuse. Um, and then also what it looks like to have a healthy um, financial relationship and what that looks like in a partnership. Um, so at any point throughout the um, presentation, please ask questions. But again, like we're, we're, this is really kind of just like casting a wide net, really explaining like what we're talking about when we think about financial abuse and how widespread and um, varied these different, this form of abuse can really be. Um, so just to get started, the objective of this uh, presentation is to understand financial abuse, how different communities um, and marginalized groups are, can be affected financial, by financial abuse. Um, and we also wanna create a greater capacity to understanding and um, noticing potential systems of power that can then lead to financial abuse. Um, so really thinking about um, the structures in place in society that can like lead someone um, to be um, trapped in a situation where they're being financially abused and then other abuses that can come along with that situation. Um, so just to kind of start off, when we think about abuse um, and abusers, um, we, there's, this, there's a lot of large assumptions that are made where usually we think of a perpetrator as a male identifying or masculine presenting person. Um, and at least when I kind of was first introduced the idea of financial abuse, in my idea, um, I definitely found myself going to like, assuming that the person who's um, the abuser was the person who was financially independent, was the person who was the breadwinner, was the person who was making the money, um, and really the source of income. Uh, we think about a victim or survivor um, in abuse situations at large, but I think also um, within financial abuse situations. Uh, a lot of times folks imagine that this is a person who is a female identifying or some sort of or a feminine presenting person, um, and that they are actually the financially dependent person. So the um, ability to not leave is tied to the fact that they don't, they're not able to have uh, their own financial independence um, to leave the situation. So when in reality we know, not just in financial abuse, but abuse at large, um, the perpetrator and the victim and survivors can be any gender, um, can be any socioeconomic background um, or class, can come from any educational background, um, it can also be any race or ethnicity. So when we're thinking about financial abuse, um, like we are, ca again, casting that wide net, this can affect anybody and everybody. Um, but then, of course, we have to keep in mind that there are folks um, in society who are historically at risk for financial inequality. So keeping in mind throughout this presentation that um, black, indigenous uh, people of color are historically at risk for being um, uh, for having financial inequality. Um, LGBTQ persons are as well um, due to lack of workers rights but now in recent time now there have been even more discussions I recently of um, of uh, uh, the civil rights um, workers uh, protections actually protecting LGBTQ folks um, so that's fantastic um, children are at risk of not of being dependents um, the elderly are at risk um, for also for potentially being dependent um, and also um, relying on other folks for assistance, um, either physically or um, with daily tasks and with finances as well. Um, folks who are, again, in for, uh, phys poor physical health, uh, independent of age, um, if they have to rely on somebody um, for different aspects of their life, that creates an opening for the potential financial abuse. Um, and also any folks with cognitive impairment as well. Um, you know, that reliance on other folks to, um, you know, take care of you, have access to your money and have access to pretty important aspects of your life can create a situation in which we're finding someone is, um, uh, has the ability, could possibly become um, in a financial abuse situation. So moving forward, um, 
financial abuse can take place in uh, many different situations. So um, I do kind of want to just make sure that we're understanding what we're talking about when we talk about domestic violence versus intimate partner violence. Um, so the term domestic violence is commonly referred to, um, to partner violence, but the term can also encompass child or elder abuse. Um, or abuse by any family member in a household. Um, the types of violence that exist within intimate relationships um, and the role of the abuser and victim are not gender specific. So the term intimate partner violence um, encompasses a broader understanding of violence in relationships. Um, and so the, the concept of intimate partner violence acknowledges that abuse can exist um, in any type of personal intimate relationship, regardless of sexual orientation, um, marital status, or gender. Um, and you'll see that throughout this presentation, um, I do use the term of domestic violence and I use intimate partner violence, but I just wanted to make sure that we're laying the ground of understanding that there are the distinct differences um, when we do use these words. So intimate partner violence, um, again, refers to behavior within an intimate relationship that causes physical, um, psychological, or any sexual harm to those in the relationship. Um, and this can include acts of physical violence, such as slapping, um, hitting, kicking, and beating, sexual violence, including um, forced sexual intercourse and rape, or rape, um, and other forms of sexual coercion, um, all really, which is under, which is all rape. Um, emotional or psychological abuse, um, such as insults, belittling, constant humiliation, um, intimidation, uh, destroying things, threats of harm, uh, threats to take away children or pets, um, controlling behaviors such as isolating a person from family and friends, um, monitoring their movements and restricting access to financial resources, employment, or education or medical care as well. So IPV alone affects more than 12 million persons per year. Um, in the United States, over half of trans folks um, have experienced some form of intimate partner violence, including acts of coercive control and physical harm. Um, more than one in three women and more than one in four men have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Um, nearly half of women and men have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner of their lifetime. So this is really speaking to the fact of how widespread um, intimate partner violence is um, in the United States. Um, there are many types of financial abuse and all have the same goal as power and control over the victims. And this also a quote can really kind of be spread through abuse in general. Like there are many different types of financial abuse and abuse at large, but all of the same goal is like that power and that control over the victims. So financial abuse is a common and powerful tactic used by abusers to control and isolate victims by preventing access to money. Um, or financial resources at large. So it can have long-term and devastating um, consequences um, that might include controlling how money is spent. Um, they might um, withhold money or um, give an allowance to folks. Um, they might not allow partners to work or earn their own money. Um, this might include stealing a partner's identity, money, credit, or property. Um, they also might withhold basic living resources such as medication or food. So research does indicate that financial abuse occurs in up to 99% of domestic violence cases. Um, on average, it takes domestic violence and intimate partner violence victim um, approximately seven attempts to successfully leave their abuser. Victims are 70 times more likely to be killed in the weeks after leaving their abusive partner and at any other, um, than at any other time during their relationship. Abusers can coerce their victims into staying with them or come back if they try to leave by blocking or controlling access to financial assets, locking them in this cycle of abuse. Um, so really, you know, just keeping in mind that um, when financial abuse is in play, and as we see from the statistic, like it's, it, I'm sorry, folks are mowing the lawn outside, so I'm sorry if you hear um, any of that. But um, research indicates that financial abuse is extremely widespread in um, domestic violence um, and abusive situations occurring in up to 99%. So just keeping that in mind of how um, finances can play can play a role within the relationship at large and really lock in that person into that cycle of abuse, um, preventing them from leaving. Um, and you can imagine that with the, if children are involved as well, that creates an another um, layer that this person has to, um, has to work through in order to gain safety. So financial abuse keeps a survivor trapped in an abusive relationship. 
um, and deeply diminishes the victim's ability to stay safe or leave um, after leaving an abusive partner. Uh, surveys of survivors reflect that one of the top reasons for staying in or returning to an abusive partner um, were concerns over the ability for the folk, for the person to provide financial to, to provide financially for themselves and or their children. Um, and to remember, as with all forms of abuse, um, financial abuse um, occurs across all socioeconomic, educational, um, racial, and ethnic groups. So again, um, you know, I, I guess when I was first learning about financial abuse, like years ago, um, the term really kind of stuck with me was like the idea of like white collar crimes and like you know crimes that are really happening kind of up um, up kind of the socioeconomic ladder. But you know, we have to remember that that's not the case. Um, that it really does, uh, the financial abuse is, can, is a tool that locks folks in the cycle of abuse um, with their abuser. Um, and it has, I mean, devastating effects, as we can all know, that just having financial, um, having any financial instability is already a huge stressor on folks, let alone someone trying to navigate an abusive relationship or situation, let alone whether they also then have children they should be worried about. So lacking financial knowledge or resources is the number one indicator of whether a domestic violence victim will stay, leave, or return to an abusive relationship. This is from uh, Purple Purse, which is an all-state foundation that um, has a lot of resources and um, has a lot of research about um, financial abuse and abusive situations. So other ways of financial abuse um, can affect people. Um, is financial abuse can be can look like someone trying to um, control the use or access of money that somebody else has earned or saved, um, using assets for personal benefits without asking, taking money or using credit cards without permission, um, claiming to make payments or, or pay bills in the partner's name but not actually following through with that, um, borrowing money and making charges without repaying it, feeling entitled to a partner's money or assets in general, um, demanding that the partner turn over paychecks, um, passwords, and credit cards. It can also um, interfere with jobs, so criticizing or minimizing a partner's job or career choice, pressuring partner to quit their job, sometimes using children as an excuse, um, saying that they have to take care or have to spend more time with their children, or that the partner themselves is cannot um, handle you know, taking care of the children and needs more help. Um, uh, abuse can involve telling a partner where you can and cannot work, um, sabotaging work and work-related responsibilities and experiences, um, or harassing partner at work by calling, texting, or stopping by frequently, um, and, or preventing a partner from actually leaving for work by hiding keys or unhooking a car battery. Um, I was reading a, a, a article recently that um, had to do with how um, financial abuse has kicked up, which we'll speak about a little bit later, um, during the COVID pandemic. And um, person was saying, and the individual who's um, in an abusive situation was explaining that um, her abuser was using COVID and um, the pandemic as a reason for this person to not leave. Um, so saying that if she did leave that, um, you know, because of the pandemic and using that as a reasoning, um, that you know he would lock her out he would kick her out he would do so kind of utilizing her need to go to a job to get money and make money for herself um balancing that with this extreme worry of the fact that we're in a pandemic situation and that um leaving you know is going outside and leaving like is dangerous and is exposing to the to the virus um you know, taking that hand in hand with the fact that staying and, you know, staying in this abusive situation is also extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, so, and her not being able to balance that. Um, so other ways financial abuse um, can look is controlling of shared assets. So um, the abusive partner criticizing financial decisions that are made, um, reducing the partner's freedom to plan or budget, making large financial decisions without input, refusing to uh, collaborate on finances at all, hiding or taking funds and putting them into a private account, um, insisting that a partner shares income but then refusing to share their own, refusing to work or contribute to the family income, um, controlling the purse strings or um, establishing unrealistic limits or allowances. And this, these lists of, of reasons are really just to kind of explain and um, hopefully show how widespread and how and many different modes and uh, ways there are for somebody to be financially abused and find themselves in a financially abusive situation. And also <clears throat> how difficult it would be to get out. Um, if you have somebody who has access to your money and the money you're making in your bank accounts, 
who's making these large financial decisions without telling you at all and then is reflecting back in your credit um, and you know potentially this person is then taking on a huge amount of debt um, it's a extremely really I mean I, I feel like I can't explain it enough it's a horrible situation to be in you know to be in debt let alone if it's being caused by somebody who's all who who's potentially you know, threatening your life and abusing you in different ways. So just more reasons, I can, I can go through them kind of quickly because there has been quite a few lists. Um, so for evading the victim to work, um, sabotaging work or employment opportunities, um, again, controlling how money is spent, not including the victim in um, decisions, hiding assets, stealing property, refusing to pay bills, um, and ruining the the partner of the victim's uh, credit score, filing false insurance claims, forcing the victim to turn over benefits, um, refusing to pay or evading child support, um, or manipulating divorce processes if the victim was able to get to that point um, by drawing it out um, or hiding or not disclosing certain assets. So really, even within, with the victim um, potentially being able to leave the situation, there's still ways um, that an abuser can have control over the finances that um, uh, a victim might be going through or might be dealing with after the fact. So methods and modes of financial abuse. Um, sorry, that's what that's, those were really the uh, methods and modes of financial abuse and all the different ways in which um, uh, someone can be affected. So the direct impacts of financial abuse in the short term, uh, financial abuse leaves victims extremely vulnerable to physical abuse and violence. Um, with limited or no access to money or credit cards or any financial assets, um, it's very difficult for victims um, of financial abuse to do any type of safety planning. Um, if they don't have access to, um, and then kind of thinking about with COVID being layered on this without being without having access to leave, to go um, um, speak to, um, a shelter or speak to somebody in um, in a, a victim center like CVSS, um, you know, not maybe not being able to call due to COVID if there's a decreased staff or also if you're trapped inside your um, living situation with somebody not being able to have the freedom to have space to make any phone calls. Um, maybe then, you know, if, if you're having limited money or access to financial or access to financial assets, not even having the ability to have um, a personal phone to use to call to see if you can start safety planning. Um, not being able to contact your friends um, for a variety of reasons during COVID to not being able to safety plan. So, for instance, um, if an abuser is particularly violent and the victim needs to leave in order to stay safe, um, this is difficult to do without money or credit card. And if they need to leave um, the relationship permanently, it's challenging to find safe and affordable housing. Um, they also struggle to provide basic needs like food, clothing, and transportation. Um, and then keeping in mind um, what we were speaking about before with who's historically at risk for financial abuse and who's historically at risk for financial inequality, um, layering on um, the social discriminations um, that folks of color, um, LGBTQ individuals, um, folks with different disabilities or, or who are differently abled, um, all of these social challenges as well um, that are layered on top of somebody being able to find safe housing and affordable housing, um, somebody being able to access safe health care or access um, a shelter that coincides with the, their, their um, gender identity, um, being able to have access um, to um, benefits or any to social benefits um, when they might ha not have the means to um, to to get to the location where they need to be, um, either due to COVID or due to any um, uh, difficulties they have with um, transportation, either for themselves, like physically not being able to transport themselves or not having access to a car or the money for a car. Um, what can be the direct impacts of financial abuse? For those who do manage to escape um, an abusive situation, they do often face extreme difficulties in obtaining long-term housing, safety, and security. Um, so victims often have spotting employment records, um, can have ruined credit histories, um, and mounting legal issues caused by years of financial abuse. And it can be very difficult for them to establish independence and of long-term securities. Uh, in fact, many victims stay with or return to abusers due to concerns about financial stability. Um, after leaving the abuser, all of the other kind of social social issues and um, uh, financial issues that are caused by being independent um, will start weighing this person down and really cause a need for them to go back to the abuser where there is some sort of financial um, security um, if they're that concerned about, you know, if they're um, 
uh, dealing with um, you know spotty employment records and and having a very poor credit. For those who do manage to escape the abusive situation and survive initially, they do often face overwhelming odds in obtaining long-term security and safety. And as we've been saying, these ruined credit scores um, and these kind of, and these spotty um, employment histories and any legal issues that might that might have been caused by the abuse would again make it extremely difficult to gain independence, safety, and long-term security for these folks. So, in the context of COVID. Um, domestic violence advocates have, are worrying currently that confining people with their abusers is exacerbating the frequency and intensity of abuse. Um, and as the pandemic's economic fallout furthers, it threatens the survivor's financial stability and any um, promise of being able to be, become financially stable in the future. And let me know if I'm going a little fast and let me know if there's any questions so far. Um, so financial um, or economic abuse is also quite common among um, domestic abuse survivors. So one um, study, in uh, one 2008 study um, that was published in, in uh, 2011 of 103 survivors found that almost every woman involved in the, um, in the study had been involved with a partner who controlled her, um, her use of money or access to her economic resources and who took advantage of her economically. So this layering onto the fact that this is um, extremely, extremely widespread and a very, very common tactic used by abusers to control their partners. Um, coronavirus is exacerbating a problem that has already existed um, and has not already been adequately addressed, that survivors of domestic abuse cannot afford to leave their abuse. Um, for those that do leave, as we kind of has been um, explained, the building of their life is so often expensive that they just end up having to go back. Um, kind of dealing with, you know, this history of spotty employment um, with a partner you know, telling you to um, not allowing you to go to your job or not allowing you to um, apply for jobs or do the job you want to do. Um, not having um, enough credit to sufficiently get loans or be able to afford housing. Um, so again, it's sometimes, I don't want to say easier or simpler, but sometimes the only um, thing that the, that the victim might know or might be able to do is to go back to have some sort of financial um, access at all. Um, so COVID-19 is going to financially impact almost all of us, but um, this will be much more exacerbated for survivors who are already trying to recover from the impact of economic abuse and dealing with the costs of being harmed. And this is a quote from Sonia Passi, who's the founder of Freeform, which works to establish financial security for domestic violence survivors. So how to get help and how to give help um, is making an exit plan for these folks. And again, um, this is increasingly difficult to do given this current context of the world. Um, making an exit plan is um, the folks have to have access and resources to be able to know um, how to create an exit plan, have to know what their resources are now um, comparatively to pre-COVID. Um, you know, making sure that they, whether or not they know that they have been um, exposed, whether or not they um, know, and really what has been on my mind a lot is how folks are going to deal with um, the unknown of what's happening with schools in the fall, of whether, of whether or not um, parents are going to be laden with having other children at home more often, um, possibly exposed to different abuses more, um, and also having to keep in mind that, you know, the, the children won't necessarily have a space to go for a certain part of the day where maybe that the parent can then focus on their exit plan or their situation. Um, so it'll create much more opportunity for the person to not be able to focus on themselves and what they need to do and we'll, you know, we'll put them in a situation where they really have to be um, focusing more on the day to day on, you know, making sure that they're that they're um, taking care of in that day versus planning for the future, planning how to escape and get out of their abusive situation. Um, documenting your situation so you know keeping um keeping tabs on bills um keeping tab on your um on your credit card statements on your bank statements and i'm making sure the doc that you're keeping these documentations in a safe space um not inside the home necessarily if that's possible um but just where an abuser might not have access to um creation of an emergency fund if possible this is a it's, it's wonderful to be able to create an emergency fund but um is very difficult to if the uh, victim is already in a situation of financial abuse. So if um, a victim has access to family, um, 
or or friends or anybody outside of the home that can help and give a little bit of financial um, stability that's incredible um and is hoped for for every financial situation or for every abusive situation that you know somebody would be able to step in and help um but not always the case um, finding at least one trustworthy ally who does understand financial abuse to help sort out thoughts um, and make a plan of action. Um, researching programs and services in the area that help them, um, domestic violence victims um, and might have more resources for, specific, for um, financial abuse situations. Um, canceling joint bank accounts and credit card accounts by calling the issuer and asking to have your name removed. Again, this is um, it is good to do, but also can be difficult to do if the if the victim is living um, is currently um, in a housing situation with their abuser, if the abuser could find out. Um, find out about state laws and local laws that protect, that, that, um, about protective and restraining orders and talk to domestic violence court advocates about pros and cons of protective and restraining orders in, in, uh, in your situation or in the victim situation. Um, and then healthy finances. So we've thought a lot about, you know, what does it look like for folks to be in these financially abusive situations? But um, healthy finances then look much more like both partners having access to financial statements um, and information, um, even though one partner might manage the day-to-day -day finances and bill paying. Um, couples identify when they have uh, different values about money and negotiate joint financial goals. So having conversations about uh, money and not necessarily um, you know, having to come to one, um, I mean, you know, not have necessarily, you know, being able to have communications and um, not and share the fact that you might have different values. Um, couples making set plans to meet joint goals and sticking to them. Um, couples recognizing and respecting that decision making is equal, regardless of who earns more income in what in a in a certain in a family. Um, each partner has access to money on their own without having to ask for permission or hide spending from the other partner. Um, financial decisions are made jointly between two partners and that both partners have access to money and knowledge about where and how money is being spent and neither partner is being deceitful. Um, oh, that, okay, so that was it. I, um, and if, let me know if there's any questions. I kind of got through that much quicker than I thought. Um, I thought there would be a few more um, questions being asked, but if you have any questions right now um, or any um, points of discussion, I'd love to have it. Um, and that's it. Can I, you know, I'm just th thinking about this, Beckett, so since we're a small group, mm -hmm. I'm going to just kind mm -hmm. of put this out there. Um, I'm just thinking about traditional sex roles and how much they play into this mm -hmm. and having been, you know, married in the early 80s where my vows said to obey and the financial structure that was set up with that at that time, which was normal for my peer group, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was getting married. You know, my paycheck got handed over. I got like a $20 a week allowance. Didn't know mm -hmm. what was in the, you know, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. and um, how much that still, you know, I, I think that the younger generations have a different concept going in of how they're going to handle it. But that's how we went into it. It was like, you know, you hand it over and um, he made all the decisions and paid all the bills. And I didn't even know I, I didn't have access to anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's just really interesting to going through that at that point, you wouldn't think of it as abuse, but looking back and mm -hmm. looking at how I've managed relationships after that, quite quite differently um mm -hmm. you know how generations have kind of lived under that kind of uh, financial oppression really mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and then also and that's kind of where it becomes difficult is that there can be situations um where that's an agreement that's made within the within the relationship where it's an agreed upon decision um and of course I always kind of go down to like, what's the background of that decision being made? But, um, you know, just there can be, you know, there can be situations where like two people are having a conversation and it's like, yes, like you can be in charge of the finances. Like I, and you know, and maybe the other partner's in charge of something else. But, um, so there absolutely can be situations where, um, you know, two partners are like one partner is taking a little bit more responsibility of the money um, or finances. Maybe one partner is getting like an allowance. And, you know, it's very, very situation dependent. But I completely hear you. I think that there's a lot of, um, 
you know, definitely like I've noticed that um, in my like understanding and learning of financial abuse, a lot of the conversations I've had have been, um, but wait, like I've, you know, you mentioned something that's abuse and like that was normal. Like that's just kind of what we did and like, you know, whether or not there was a conversation about it. Um, and so I think that what you're bringing up, Cheryl, is exactly the, the conversation to be having is just that, yeah, there is this shift of responsibility and folks having control of their own allowances and what, and then the question being like, well, what happens when there is a partnership that is respected, but there is this kind of like power dynamic between somebody having more more access to money and somebody having less access. And just, you know, how does that play a role? How does that affect other, other um, issues in the relationship? And like, at what point does it become abuse? Becky, I just yes. want to add that, um, stop. I want to add that, um, you know, sometimes even though it's agreed upon, there's that secondary game um, because um, my daughter actually was in a situation like that where all the signs of DV were there, but she couldn't see it. And um, so when they were planning to um, move into their own house, you know, he was telling her, you know, let me control the finances. Um, we will, you will have your check deposited in my account, but her name wasn't going to be on it. Um, and so, but it was presented to her in a way where he was portraying himself as someone that could handle the finances, save money for them. And, um, um, you know, have this nice future for them when it comes time to retiring. Like he was talking the pension talk, the 403B and all of this other stuff. Um, and then later on, you know, we found out that the, his credit score was like 400, all the credit cards were maxed out. Um, but, you know, on the surface, it sound good and it looked good and it had, um, you know, had captured her ears and she was just like all gun ho. And then um, a couple months later, there was an incident that involved um, brandishing a weapon, menacing and so forth. And so, you know, earlier on when we was like, I, I could see it and my husband is a police officer and, you know, he could see it and we was talking to her, but she didn't see it. She saw it as kind of like what you said as we're entering into an agreement, but it wasn't really an agreement. You know, it was another means of controlling not just the environment and her, but her finances too, you know, so that now there's this dependent on him, you know, for whatever I need, right? If she needs something, then it's going to have to be like, go to me. And then there's that that power and control, right? Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's just amazing to me how you know, um, an abuser or an aggressor will present it, you know, as let's, let's agree and give you all the reasons why and make it look and sound really good. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, like Cheryl, um, I actually got married in 1990. I've been married 30 years now. Um, and, you know, back then, you know, my mom used to say, you know, he wear the pants, he wear the pants. He wear the pants, like you have the skirt, he wear the pants. And, you know, so that was like drilled in my head. And so, you know, in early on in the marriage, like I kind of felt like, okay, that that's all your responsibility. Like, you know, didn't really see it as a power and control dynamic, but more so this is the norm. You know, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so it's just interesting how times have evolved and how you know, some people have taken that out of the perspective from back then and will still try to hold to some of those values, but really not for the right reason, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so it's really interesting. But with yeah. fi financial abuse, do you find that you see it more with elders or is it just cross, you know, or everybody? Like, mm -hmm. Because when I when I like when I think of financial abuse, usually the elders come to mind, you know, where people are trying to 
manage their social security check or their disability or their retirement or their pension or you know whatever it is that um their income that they're receiving that people try to take advantage of that like i never really looked at it financial abuse um you know outside of domestic violence like i know it exists in domestic violence um but i didn't look at it from a, any other lens like where it could be happening you know and now i'm hearing you and it's like you know another light bulb kind of go off like you know don't put a don't put this in a box of two categories right dv and elder but that it actually exists and it could happen to anybody you know it's it it's very interesting. I wish more people was on here. This is really interesting. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your your story, Pat. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, I everything you're saying, I absolutely hear you. When I was doing research for this, um, because from my from my background, I have stepped into like speaking and learning about financial abuse like from that intimate partner violence lens. That was my first um not my first, but that was when I really kind of started learning and kind of understanding the different forms of abuse and how power and control can affect relationships. It really was from that, from the intimate partner violence um, lens of, you know, you know, power and control of, you know, what does it mean where somebody pays for your meal and then expects, you know, and then how do you pay, you expect something from you, um, which is a whole other, con yeah, which is a whole other conversation. And I had trouble with this um, presentation, honestly, trying to find the lens um because exactly i i was finding a lot of conversations like about financial abuse focusing on elder abuse and focusing on um where, where it's it's you know it's rampant and absolutely like elders are at a huge risk and are, and are financially abused at, a, at an extremely high rate um and then with this yeah i was trying to like show the multiple lenses and hopefully um with this list like trying to show like I was using the term partner quite a bit and actually now like reflecting i'm like mm, maybe that could have because really a lot a lot of the um aspects on the list so could also be parent to child could be yeah. honestly child to, old, to an elder parent could be caregiver to an elder um you know it could be a lot of different situations so thank you that's highlighting for me like the language that i use i'm actually like mm, I, this could have been i could have used you know, i could have expanded the language a little bit more but um the like, excellent job that did thank you thank you yeah and i'm thank you and i what'd you say i open up for me i'm glad i'm glad yeah and i i do also um i think like having the conversation about how it's shifted and how it's changed and like what you're highlighting i think like it it sounds so good like in a partner should be like yes like you control, like you know control like if you handle that i'll handle this um, but it really does, especially with finances, it just opens up like such a, you know, a huge lane, like for the potential of different forms of abuse and different really like withholding of access to needs and to um, resource. And that like is really what I see is like one of the. You, um, one of the things yeah. that I want to do at my um, staff meetings, um, Charlo, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm switching it up. Um, one of the things that I want to do is have different um staff within family services do a presentation mm -hmm. because what i found was that the staff for example i have two new staff that don't know about cheryl's program mm -hmm. who's right down the block from us yeah that to utilize that time to educate um the staff on the resources that we have available within family services um because mm -hmm. a couple of times i got a call it was like Oh, I think this person is under the influence and they might have been drinking. What do I do? So, you know, if like, you know, Cheryl or someone from her program do like, you know, a one on one or substance abuse or something like that. So that's I shifted on the way that the all staff meetings are held and I want 30 minutes to be um, a presentation. So I'm just wondering why well, I have the two of you. Um, if you would be available to sit in on our staff meetings go sit down and wait our staff meetings are on um tuesdays and it would be from 11 30 to 12 to do a presentation if you can come um i don't know what your availability is next week if that's too short notice um okay to do a presentation to the staff because this was very important oh. to me and they work with families right Definitely. I'm just looking at my schedule right now. If a oh, yeah. family, so I'm gonna 
ask them to put you on that calendar invite. You know, so the family says, this is what's happening. They can recognize that these are early signs of financial abuse. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know, to have that discussion. Yeah. Do you want me to, I can want me to change it to be more kind of focused on those early signs so they can pick it up? Whatever is going to work for you. I found okay. your you right now to be very helpful. Okay, very cool. Helpful. I can keep it as is. Yeah. Got and so it. if you have like a Tuesday that's available, you're available from the 11 to 11.30, I would love to have you um, do a presentation as well, you know, and the people know who we, who you are. Right. <laughs> it's yeah, I exactly. would look at maybe I have a grant due next week, so I'm like, eh, nothing's happened until that that goes in. But maybe yeah. August 11th. Okay. 1130. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've done that before for your program, but I don't. I think only Tess was there when I did it. So. It's... Well, this is going to be part of the staff meeting, so everybody will be there. Awesome. That's great. I like that. That's a yeah. good idea. Just for utilizing his training to get everybody on the same page. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Pat, I'm good. You said next week. I'm good for next week. Okay. Jaden, I want you to leave that alone. That's all I have. This is really good. 